Hello. Hello. How Hi. are you? Can you hear me well? I can hear you perfectly. You? Good. Very good. I'm so happy to see you. I'm about to say finally, just because you're in my head much longer than you know. So, yeah, because you know, I've started practicing in the summer. <laughs> I get that a lot. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. I, I think actually that's part of why I had the sort of uh, the nerve to just, you know, say, because I felt like I, I knew you in a way. So, you know, you're in my head. I might as well ask you if you're up for an interview. And I am. How, how do I pronounce your name, by the way? Is it Amalia? Amalia. 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 Yes. Well, nice to meet you. I get, I get that a lot, like I bump into people in Cyprus especially a lot that we're talking for a while and then like they say what do you do and, and they're like oh shit I'm listening to you every day I'm doing the phone. <laughs> yeah, so know. tell me what, where, where is this room that uh, you're in? You're, what are you playing? What am I playing? Yeah the room there's, there's a guitar and something else. Oh that's what I used to play actually that's just for kind ah. of voice practice or whatever. Uh, I play violin mostly. Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> S- since you were young, or is that like a? No, I started that when I was twenty-three, I think. So it was it was like um, when I finished university, and I needed something to be obsessed about. Otherwise, I didn't know how to function, uh, and that was my degree for like years before. Okay. So I found the violin, and I and I got very obsessive and was like playing every day and took free private classes a week and I started to play in like student orchestra after just a few months it was crazy I got very obsessed it uh, sounds like yeah well it's a psychologist in me but uh, in psychology there's this term it's it's quite sterile but I think finally it, you know it applies well to some people high need for cognition the which one high need for cognition Hmm. I don't. I don't know. I think it's uh, no. No. Like I recognize that my brain uh, responds maybe a bit too much to to kind of like positive recognition and being like hyper aware of anything that that like limits my freedom. I'm really careful not to function on that level. You know. So i think it's easy to tell if you look at the project i don't use my face a lot and, and myself a lot in in that way because i'm you know I, so i don't want to be governed by that mm. um, i think i just i just i need something to be excited about otherwise i'm just like what am i doing on this rock you know i just <laughs> heard something very interesting uh, there is um do you know who peter atia is the is that peter atia is a doctor And he's like, uh, he has a podcast and his obsession is longevity and like all sorts of interventions that can help all of us be like healthy, healthy centenarians and, and thrive when we're a hundred. And in, he interviews very interesting people. So he interviewed this guy who wrote a book called The uh, Comfort Crisis. And it's about how, you know, we're too comfortable. I've heard this theory, so I don't know if I got a video or something. So, and, and then the thing is, the thing where it overlaps with what I think what you're saying is that boredom is very, very important because boredom tells us that whatever it is that we're doing is no longer worth our while in a way. And it's, it's a very important cue to tell you evolutionarily that you should go on and pursue something else because you're about to have maximized the benefits of continuing on this track for example if you and i went out hunting and after three days like we we don't come across any animal where we are and at some point we get bored <laughs> in a way it's our brain telling us you know we should really be trying a different strategy because <laughs> this one is not panning out yeah. and that And that in a way by killing boredom, which is what we've done with our iPhones, we've, uh, we've eliminated a very important cue that tells us whether we're on the right track or not. Well, yeah, I mean, I think there's like an endless list of, of like brain circuits that have been hacked into with a phone, right? It's terrible. Absolutely. It's the, you know? It is terrible. 
it's not cool. But uh, yeah. you know what you say is 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 also relevant. Like in the next steps, I'm taking with language transfer because you know I got bored at some point of just dissecting languages, right? So I changed the whole direction of the project to direct other people to do it and to open the method to new subjects. And now suddenly, like I'm more motivated again, and everything feels new and fresh, you know. And uh, yeah, it took me a while to figure out like what what I had to what I had to do with that feeling, you know. And there was a period even when I was like, okay, I'm just gonna like set it up to leave language transfer in other people's hands, and you know, leave it behind. Uh, but no, I definitely found that that thing that I'm not bored anymore. <laughs> so so let me so let me take a step back, okay, and ask you some a few questions, like in a little bit more of a methodical way uh sh shall we decide eventually to put this online so people know where yeah, yeah. they are and what we're talking about um but so tell me um but this is even before the formal part i have i can't i can't uh estimate how old you are it's like it's like with everything that you've accomplished and i get i don't have any sense i mean it's not that important but just personally it's, that it's secret? That's, that's curious for me because i have a having all kinds of like uh, age issues at the moment. I'm okay, so you don't need to tell me. I don't- No, 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 no. I mean, it's fine, okay. it's fine. It's just like, don't get my head around my age. Like I'm 37 and I don't, I don't really understand when I look at 25 year olds that I'm not in there. When I talk to them, I understand it, oh. right? In right. my head, I'm still like, especially now that I'm getting back into being especially motivated um, and I'm back in Cyprus, which are where I was 80 years ago. I'm not understanding very well that I'm not in my mid twenties at the moment. Yeah, it takes. <laughs> then, no, then I no, clean no. the mirror, right? I, I clean the mirror, and I'm just like, what the? <laughs> so, 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 when did this? How did you? Uh, how did you get interested in language? When did this project start? Those are two very different questions. I know, I right. know, and it's and I'm breaking the oh. number one rule, which is not to ask more than one question at a time. But I have so many; I'll have to try and pace. But myself. I can join it. But they're different things because, okay. like, my first interest in language was when I was a child, and I was just surrounded by languages, which seemed like a really weird kind of magic. Especially, so I grew up on the outskirts of East London. Uh, so you know you would go into the i'll go into the post office with my mum, for example and the lady would be like shouting across from the till to the, the post office glassy bit to her husband um in urdu i think but not that i know anything about languages then but like with the sound that left <laughs> in that way, i think it might have been urdu. and then just switch to this like queen's english with my mum, and that was just what well, and then my family is Cypriot, so they were speaking Greek in, in, the, in their case, Cypriot Greek uh, in the family. And I never learned it when I was a kid. So it was always just something totally intangible and fascinating. So you uh, were not like a, like a magically, enormously talented at, with languages growing up? I had up. no study in language until I was an adult. Like, I, well, I was 18. Oh, wow. I started a law degree and I changed from law to this language. This is so optimistic to hear this, right? Because I think in, in my head, I'm like, yeah, it's nice that you developed this method, but yeah, everybody most thinks likely I'm, uh, just like a polyglot well, and like naturally I have to work talented. Very, very hard. <laughs> but that's really? thing, like, I had to work very hard on 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 everything I did. And I, I wanted to share that, you know, like I started this language degree and I was the, for the first semester, the, the worst in the class. Like I didn't, I didn't understand, you know, there's certain things, there's a lot that when, 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 hold on, I'm just going to do a preemptive measure, get my cat out. Okay. okay. What's his name? I just call him Radagi, which just means little cat. <laughs> but if he needs a birth certificate, uh, I'll make one up. <laughs> uh, what what were we saying? That uh, you started out and it was very difficult, 
at the language. Oh, yeah, okay. So I think one of the general problems in teaching is that there's the longer you teach, the more disconnected you are from all the stuff that the person you're teaching doesn't know. So to put that in a simpler way, you just take more and more for granted. So to think of a, I mean, and, and, and the, the neurodiversity means that different children or different students generally will, will, will have different ideas, different, different ways of thinking that makes, that leads them to take different things for granted, right? So to give you an example, I started to go to Greek school when I was a kid very briefly. Um, and I remember like learning the alphabet, which was just copying the alphabet down off the board, but with no explanation, no, nothing to help me understand what another language even is. So I used to just think it was like a code that you would write English in. So I found it really kind of, um, how do you say? Like phonetically in a way? Yeah, so I found it really right. debasing, so to speak, that it had a different number of letters because I could never understand that. I could never get my head around that. You know, if it's just, just if like- it's just code. another code. Yeah, right. to write it's English just a secret in. language, why would you have a different number of and, elements? You know, so right. generally, so I, I mean, I had just the, the least amount of language consciousness I can, I can imagine now that my mind is so different and I see things in such a different way to look back and, and just to find it really took me ages to even understand that the verbs in Spanish were changing to match the person. Do you know what I mean? Like it took me, took me a good while to figure out that that's what was going on. And yet it was very something in that really attracted you like the mystery or the understanding that mystery because you know like someone else might be just like okay so this is not for me right well yeah i mean that's how i that's how i was thinking right so this is but not you did what but you did go to study like so that. i mean i was having that experience of this is not for me and then in a materials development class we came across this michelle thomas uh uh, material which uses this kind of basic socratic system which i use okay this question yeah. and answer system right so right. this is like this this is like that how do you say whatever so just doing that got me far enough that i could employ my usual very like analytical obsessive mm. pattern hunting way of thinking like i wasn't lost anymore so that sent me into a mental overdrive. So there was two things groundbreaking for me about the Michelle Thomas material. And that was the fact that you were learning things horizontally. So you were building sentences, which means you need to learn a little bit different from, you know, different things from each area of the language. And that um, there was a total freedom there in that you could teach anything in any order that you wanted. So I really liked that. And then uh for this materials course development part of my degree I, I took that freedom and then when we had to develop material to show to our student to our teachers I did it kind of from that perspective and they just like didn't fail me by one mark so for everything they wouldn't fail me by one mark because they didn't like what I was doing wow interesting yeah. what, <laughs> what, it was like a different the only reason I didn't fail shift. I mean, I didn't fail because I was doing so well in Spanish. So, you know, the teachers talk and they're like, no, this is a star pupil. And they're like, oh, well, we hate him. Um, <laughs> but it's like, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting sign that you're pushing against the existing paradigm. Yeah, I mean, you can do that in a useless way as well and, and get a bad mark. But <laughs> I don't think this was, right? So, I mean, right. it wasn't, it's never been for me about the this approach in itself, right? So this approach in itself has as much potential to cause chaos and confusion and breakdown as it does to cause uh, a learning experience like, like those. It has a name other than being a Socratic approach, but does it have oh, So a name? for me, there's the difference between, and there's some legal, there were some legal, or there are, I don't know, some legal issues <laughs> here uh, in regards to, so the, the company that this, Michelle Thomas, who's now passed away was, recording courses with have patented the pause button so as far as they're concerned <laughs> the pausing and making the sense <laughs> the effort. I see. And for me that's like no michelle thomas didn't do that that was socrates with no pause button um right. this whole general approach and that's not the method the method is what you do with that time right right so 
Right. Uh, the approach, you know, I'm happy to say the general approach is the same, but the method for me is very right. different. So, uh, the language transfer method is called the thinking method, which started as a kind of ironic name, um, but it stuck. Uh, Can you unpack the irony for me? Well, the fact that we're not generally taught to think, right? We're generally just exposed ah, to like, this okay. is what you don't know, go and know it, right? Um, and, and I've written a book about the method. There's, it's like, it's very long and boring. Uh, like 450 page book all but about it's really accessible right i've seen i've noticed no yeah it's free it's, it's available for free pdf but you know like right hard copies as well and uh, what have you um yeah so i'm very interested in unpacking these ideas these essential ideas beyond language now as well so i started to make a music course and that's to show but first how did this yeah but but let's I, i'm gonna drag you back a few years just to get a sense of how it you know how it developed and then a lot of people got attracted to it right so so when did you decide to do something for uh world peace huh. um well to be honest i was i was oh it's complicated so i was i was working at ngos in argentina i was living in argentina and i was also studying violin and what have you and i got very disheartened with the ngos Mm -hmm. um, as anybody working in an NGO moderately sincere mm -hmm. will probably end up being and decided that um, I wanted to dedicate myself to music and was just teaching uh, classes to pay for all of that I had experiences teaching English to Spanish speakers that made me realize like the value of my material and mm -hmm. that I needed to make it available for free and then also mm -hmm. kind of like trying to wrestle with myself trying to understand how I was going to fulfill this need for impact that I was searching at the NGOs, I realized, oh, the course can be that. So my idea was just to record uh, Spanish, English for Spanish speakers in Spanish. Ah, like, it was okay. a contribution to the Spanish speaking world before I said bye bye. And, uh, I you know, uh, start this, started this Cyprus period in my life. And then I came to Cyprus and my... And was that the first time that you went, that you lived in Cyprus? Yeah, it was the first time I lived here. I came mm -hmm. when I was a kid for a holiday only, but my, my parents mm -hmm. are, my, my whole family is Cypriot. Like, you know, there's a very big uh, diaspora in London. I think most Cypriots are born in London than in Cyprus. <laughs> really? Enough. I yeah. didn't know that. Uh, I think so. Or is it more in London? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. Um, but that's just because they count everyone with Cypriot descent as Cypriot, right? But anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, so I came here and in part of my like, the indoctrination regarding the Cyprus problem, uh, I, I saw impact here for what I knew how to do, right? But that means I needed to learn Greek and Turkish. and teach Which you didn't know at that time. I didn't know. Incredible. And teach them. But like, what is the best way to teach yourself is writing through ideas and finding that some of them are wrong and et cetera, et cetera, right? So I started to do that. And that was at the same time that I, I kind of like accidentally started this Occupy Buffer Zone movement where we went to the buffer zone dividing the capital and slept there to, to protest the division that we want to be together, etc. And uh, I edited some of the first Greek calls there. I remember like there's a photo where I've got this giant uh, wow. headphones on, which there's later a video. Sounds like an exciting period. Destroying an axe. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was. And we were riding off the back of like the Arab Spring and all of this kind of like mm -hmm. global set and Occupy and, and global celebration of, of protest, which we, I don't think that went to the best place, but at the time it was a, it was a nice kind of crash to be doing this stuff in. Right. So we could really push. Yeah, it. we're going to bring down Wall Street, right? Like we could push uh, much more than what we would have done. I mean, everybody ended up getting beaten up by the police in the end. I wasn't there, but I mean, uh, I'd left already. So, uh, but that would have happened much sooner than <laughs> what we did do it now. Do you know what I mean? Because we were, I mean, I was there for months. The, the whole, the last, uh, the police, it started in October and the police raid was in April, but I'd left. Can, two can I, can I ask you how your parents, uh, responded to that to you going back to cyprus and suddenly getting involved politically and i mean 
I'm a psychologist, so forgive me. That's my angle. <laughs> uh, well, I don't, I don't have contact with my father since I was a teenager, mm -hmm. um, and you know, neither of them presented me with Cypriot culture in any other way that was really mm -hmm. direct. I mean, they are a direct result of the empire and the diaspora. It's very clear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in the social political cultural failings that mm. they are you know but they, like i said they didn't uh talk to us in greek even though i was asking for them when i was a kid and whatever so it was odd for me to to do this so i guess that was uh, my my whole family's like what is he doing but to be honest i think it was like the argentine version of myself let's mm. say because i went there you know when i was like 20 or something 21 and you know assimilate it entirely as you do when you're that young and especially if you have something you don't want to go back to you no know? right and then that guy was like oh oh that's interesting you know i'm an interesting like product of of this uh, also like true language you start learning about the world right like the british empire and all this for kind of sure stuff. you did not learn about it at school growing up in the uk so then you start realizing like oh the, the people I've come to study through studying language, those interesting anthropological phenomena in the world, oh, I'm one of them. <laughs> and, well, and then I wanted to go and investigate what that meant. So um, characteristic of my like very sharp decision-making, I just bought a piano. I was living in a bed seat, got this like full-size piano into a bed seat. And then like six weeks later, I'm like, I have to leave. You know, I sell everything <laughs> and, I, and I come to Cyprus. Wow. And so, so then people started to, to get interested in what you're doing, right? Well, yeah, Cyprus is a perfect kind of platform for that because it's a really small place with not a lot of people doing a lot of stuff. So it was the perfect place to come and play at doing something, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know any of that, but it was just like five minutes in to having released a bit of material. Like I'd be walking around with a language transfer T-shirt on and people would be like, oh, you're from language transfer. Oh, cool. I heard about it. And that was wow. insane for me. You know, like I was really young. Well, coming from such a huge place like London. Where yeah, and also like just to hear something that is like a, something that you invented in your head and then suddenly it's a thing. Oh, you're it's from in the world. You're from language transfers. I kind of, um, yeah, but like other people probably <laughs> relate to that as an object in the world. It has, right? That it has a, like it exists, not just in your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, but I don't, I don't, there's, there's elements of that that I don't really understand. And, um, like I don't understand the out the outreach and and it's not something I follow actively. Like occasionally I have to go into some some site metric something for app guys or whatever, and I see like user figures and and I occasionally like usually every time that happens I share it because it's the first time in three months and then I can't believe like what the user figures are, but um, yeah it's not something really that that I understand so to speak and that's good because. And then you, you, I think you have all kinds of problems managing and uh, regulating your identity, identity and sense of self, like when you're subject to so much celebration, because it's surprising yeah. the sort of feedback uh, that the project gets. And, you know, so of like on the app, I don't, I don't go and read it, you know, like right. just too much. I can get You don't want to get hooked free. on that. Yeah, like I can get through two or three and I can realize that hormonally or something, you know, I can feel these little things being released. Of course. <laughs> and of I'm course. like, the, the, that's, not a right. rabbit, that's not a rabbit hole I want to go down. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, like, you know, from a psychological perspective, I can say, you know, you, you're very right to be cautious. I definitely made a lot of mistakes in that sense with my way of working. Like I made, like everything I'm saying that's smart about the way of dealing with the positive feedback. Uh, I did learn the hard way but I did it wrong I mean in in the sense of like you know I've been working at three languages at the same time so that's reading about writing editing teaching for three different languages at once all day and all night and then I noticed that even though I was suffering that my brain was addicted to it and I understood that I'd, I'd fallen into all these mistakes I did a lot of work that I'm still doing to work in a healthy way 
but then how did you, but you did manage to sort of allow other people in to take it forward to develop new courses for more languages? No, I how mean, did that come? how did that happen? So far, it's all me. So all the languages that you see so far, I made mm. them. Um, I'm trying oh, to. Oh, wow. Open, open so how it. many languages is, uh, you speak right now? So I, I, I mean, I made to publishing level because there's more that, I mean, I fiddled with other languages, but I've made nine courses now, but I don't use all of those languages. So some like Swahili, for example, I think it might be the most comprehensive Swahili course like in the world. <laughs> And I've never had Probably. a conversation in Swahili because I've, I've never had the opportunity and I've looked for them. But um, uh, I work with native speakers to like check my material and blah, blah, right. blah. There's a process there to make sure that, you know, that what I'm saying is correct. Um, and, you know, after doing quite a few languages, I kind of, for part, one part, I didn't have the need as much to have a long period practice in the language to teach it. But for the other part, because of the time, pressures and all of the pressures on the project and all of what everybody was asking for which I, I couldn't handle emotionally that now I've got much better of, of, of being laid back uh like I bypassed that period like there's languages that I never used that I made the the courses for now I'm focusing on getting native speakers trained in the method and then me taking a right where I'm helping four to eight people at once making and, and and how come like how it takes a, I don't know, I imagine it takes a lot of dedication to keep making all this stuff available for no cost to people everywhere. What, why aren't you going into, you know, a paper something model? Well, like I said, I mean, you know, I was at this time in my life when I was trying to understand how I was going to balance my different needs. And one of those is a need for impact. Like I have it very... Um, you know, I know for a lot of people it's fashionable lately and they all drive me crazy. Uh, you know, like this uh, social warrior kind of persona and whatever. But for me, it's a very unavoidable uh, need that I have tried to escape from and get away from and reclaim freedom over my life. But I understand, and you know, it might be a psychological problem, but I need to the positive things that make me feel good so that's discovery learning blah 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 i need to do impact with it it feels mm. like a waste that it stops mm. uh at me mm. you know i think it's just a personality trait to be honest so you didn't want any any to put any break on your impact and so this is why it's uh, it's widely available yeah, I mean, I'm motivated by impact. So if I was selling these courses, I don't think I'd be motivated to make such good courses. I see. Like these are literally ah, best courses see. money can't buy, you know, because if I was selling them, I would be thinking how to make the best selling courses. Actually, now, language right. transfer was very slow getting going because there was a high level of trust needed for people to actually try it and go, this guy isn't a loon. Now, that, that we, don't, we don't have that anymore because anyone looks at the feedback and they trust it and they give themselves into it. But before that, you know, um, that, 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 wasn't, that wasn't the case. So if I was thinking about money, I would have done things in a very different way, I right? See. To get people in, whereas- that's, that's a beautiful way to put it and it's a very good explanation. I think I get a, <laughs> I, I get a better picture now. Um, so, so how did you um, move into the, the music appreciation course that's being offered now? So I want to show that the method works for things that aren't, uh, for other things other than language, no, because there's certain concepts. And I just published today, actually, that I'm offering these workshops internationally because I gave one here a little while ago and I really enjoyed it to, to train teachers just generally how they can apply the ideas of the method to their subject area, whatever the mm -hmm. subject area is. So I wanted to demonstrate that. And then I went back to the first love that I gave up to make language transfer. So I gave up, like I sold my violin for paying for language transfer costs. I, uh, you know, I'd given up pain for some years and now I've, I've gone back to it. And, you know, I, and I had exactly the same experience I had in my musical education with, that I had in language education, which is just like, this is a perfect fifth. This is a major third. This one comes with that one because uh and it's like but why so i 
it's partly something I owe to myself, you know, to do it for music. But I wanted to do a subject that wasn't languages to help expand this project. So, you know, I want people to be able to learn anything from chemistry to gastronomy uh, through this, this method, which is not so much a method, you know, to learn things, but a way of looking at and under, understanding them, which informs how you learn them, no? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, could you say that you're doing the philosophy of, like the philosophy of Greek to English speakers or the philosophy of music to, like there's something philosophical about the way- For sure, that... for sure. But philosophy, I think in itself is quite deliberately not practical like philosophy you know, as a word, right? It's like mm. a lover of wisdom and it's like wisdom for wisdom sake, mm, mm. right? Where this is much more practical, but it's got this philosophical tangent, which is meta information, no? So- Or the it, logic. It's like, to me, as a, as a student, trying out your courses like before. So uh, we go to Greece all the time. We have uh, a house in Greece. And after seven years, I was like, okay, if I come here all the time, perhaps it would be wise to try and dig a little bit deeper into the language and what better way than to try and, you know, pick up some Greek. And then I started with Duolingo because that just seemed, you know, accessible and was fun and nicely designed. And after a month of doing that, I was like, what? This is getting me nowhere, you know? Yeah, exactly. Is- I mean, but that is yeah. language learning generally. Um, you know, it's just like graphic design and promises. And the point is that you pay before you decide that you're stupid and you can't learn. So that's, that is- And then, right. And then I, and then I started, I found your course and I started listening to that. And I was telling my, I, you know, I was excited and I started telling my family, I was like, listen, uh, Meno, Perimeno, Epimeno, right? And it's like, and, and it, gets you a glimpse into the culture and you know because we already got a sense of the culture it was even funny to a certain extent because you could sort of get you know why uh I, to stay on a point would be to insist right yeah, and yeah. so and and so it'd be so i started thinking of it as as logic as like it's teaching me the logic of greek and so I guess may, perhaps that's a better term than philosophy. I mean, but it's, I, it is definitely a good term. It's just applicable in one element of the method, right? So right. There's, also, like, there's a section of the book that says, there's called 10 things we do in the thinking method, which is I think the best kind of summary we can get. And it's still about 80 pages or so. But <laughs> just, you know, there's competing consideration of stuff we want to do. And then that, leads to the ultimate course design no so mm. that's one element but then the, the 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 general thing is looking at like why we do that no so somebody might look at the courses and be very focused on the way we convert vocabulary at the beginning of some courses and think that that's the method but no the reason you do that is the same reason you do 20 other things or which has got to do with like not reinventing the wheel which has got to do with teaching one language specifically from one language not just translating a russian course mm-hmm. from spanish into english and expecting it to be the same course which is kind of mindless no um, yeah it's interesting you know it's like they say that there are two main barriers to creativity one is knowing too much and the other is knowing too little so, because when you know too little, in a way, you find yourself uh, reinventing the wheel, which is a waste of energy, right? And it's like... And it cues, and that's, so that goes to another point of things we do in the thinking method is we cue correctly. So if you're teaching people things that they already know, uh, even implicitly, like reinventing the wheel, then you're not cueing to the student when to tune in and when not to, what is important information, what isn't important information, because, mm. you know, like... You can read a grammar book and have a lot of descriptions of stuff that coming from English to Spanish, for example, you would do all perfectly subconsciously, just kind of like translating the structure over or without having to look at the grammar of it, you know, right? because you're just reinventing the wheel. Both languages are doing the same thing. And then when you do, 
if you do do that, then you're really unsure of like what it is you have to learn. Like imagine memorizing a whole bunch of stuff. And then when you finally, finally really understand it, the point is that you realize you already knew it, uh, which is why actually one of the, I think the most recent LT tagline is learn a language as if you knew it already, <laughs> you know, mm. because that's kind of a, a big part of it. And then, you know, you can't, you can't cue for that if you're, if you're just describing a second language in a way that doesn't have the first language in mind and what right. is already doing, you know? But then how do you, so what's your reference for when you teach music appreciation? What's your anchor then? Um, so there's, there's that, the general idea there is that there's a whole bunch of stuff for any subject that we already know and we can transfer mm. over. So mm. in the case of uh, music, it's not from one language to another, mm. but for example, your brain detects overtones to understand, mm. to differentiate sounds. So if you're in a supermarket and you're hearing your phone ring and a beep at a checkout and a song, mm. an announcement, and your, 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 your ear, which is just like, you know, mm. these eardrums, right? Uh, mm. has an amazing, or your brain has an amazing ability to differentiate those sounds. And one of the ways it does it is it looks for the overtones. So that's not just mm. the fundamental pitch, the resonant structure inside the pitch. So we begin learning tonality, mm -hmm looking at that and that's something you're already doing you know so there's there's mm. a whole lot of things there that, that can be oh, transferred beautiful. over and actually that's why music makes sense the only reason makes it music makes sense is because there's a whole bunch of stuff your brain was already doing that music hijacked to make music with which oh, is beautiful. Like consciousness and then you got all of these very kind of strange kind of psychedelic meta considerations that run throughout this course, which is another thing that really excites me, because I'm I'm not one of these people that takes like reality and existence in their stride, you know. Like I oh, I'm I'm one of the biggest proponents of uh, psychedelics and psychotherapy in my country for sure. I write about it all the time. I uh, I really think it's the future of psychiatry. I I I sure. would, and, I would um, agree. I, yeah, and you know, like. Um, I, just generally speaking, I've always been like this, even as a kid, you know, find it hard just to just to accept reality, so to speak. And it's something that I moved away from to get on with life. And music is definitely pulling me back down that that rabbit hole. And so I do you also you make fun. music? Mm. Is it is it available uh, anywhere so, and people could listen to it? Probably, yeah. Uh, here <laughs> um not yet not yet i will i will share something i'm excited to hear what the students compose because so the, the course isn't so much for musical appreciation as you said but uh it's introduction oh. to music theory in in brackets right so there's a reason why mm -hmm. theory is in brackets mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but the idea is appreciation and uh, you'll be able to compose so you'll be able to finish mm -hmm. the series and compose so i'm i'm looking forward to seeing what like Oh wow! Produce, nice. Like hearing their sound, but uh, I compose like tangos and and some stuff that you know that is just kind of sitting around and needs polishing. So at some point in the course, I'm including some of my compositions to talk about like you know what thought because when it's your own music, you're definitely sure, right? Like how how you made that structure, what thought you had, you know. So. Uh, in the coming classes, I'll include a couple of examples, but it's nothing too magical. I mean, I just started composing really during writing this course. So I'm just really happy it makes any musical sense at all. <laughs> it's, it's very exciting. You know, I know that in Israel, um, there are some activist groups that use your uh, use language transfer to learn Arabic because, uh, you know, sadly in, in Israel, uh, most people, most uh, Jewish Israeli get exposed to Arabic in school contexts where they're taught very uh, pragmatic, you know, like, you know, national, nationalistic, like needs and agendas driven Arabic studies. And so it's not, so, you know, a, a lot of the magic and a lot of the potential for you know bringing people together is lost when people are introduced to language in this context. And so I do know that 
the groups who use your method to yeah i i they've been in touch well i don't know if it's the same groups but i mean it's especially interesting and contentious because you have these two languages that are so similar that share so much that destroy this kind of dividing rhetoric of like you know black and white and being opposites and yeah it's an especially interesting pair and i really hope that that somebody knuckles down and actually makes these like Hebrew and Arabic courses to record. I started working with some people really briefly. It didn't really go anywhere. They had kind of like other priorities and whatever, but I'm hoping that, that these courses get recorded. Fingers crossed. And perhaps one day, uh, you know, you'll have a psychotherapy course. That would be amazing. So many people around the world need, you know, psychotherapy. There aren't enough therapists. There aren't enough therapy students, not enough therapy instructors and the world needs right i'm a bit weary generally of self-help because it's never separate from cultural phenomena oh no not for the for example, student, not for clients for therapists ah but i am what i was going to say for, for yeah. clients so to speak um i am very interested in this like general kind of neurology like looking from the objective perspective of what the brain does in certain circumstances right so we can all have like higher mental consciousness so for example many people were traumatized the last year by the pandemic their relationships are breaking down their brains doing a whole bunch of stuff that's making them question even like oh do i know who i am am i this terrible person then we enter into cycles of denial and self-delusion and getting more aggressive with our partners and blah blah blah, blah. Right. so a more objective that's not like focused on therapy but it's focused on neurology then that for sure what, what what's the term that you're using i don't know if it's the correct one but i'm saying neurology i'm not sure oh neurology it. yeah neurology so, right like looking yeah. at how would it be that yeah. looking at how the brain like reacts for example to trauma or yeah, for sure i mean we don't like we, we don't have the biomarkers in psychology to the same extent that we have if like you know you're eating too much sugar and your insulin goes up and then your body becomes resistant to insulin and it doesn't clear away the sugar level so like we don't have that it's not at that level but for sure you know we know that we have the amygdala and we know that the your amygdala I mean, responses focused on behavior and no? also noticing like okay exactly the brain gets this rather than you know like the, the brain gets this coping mechanism people tend to you know because i read a lot about trying to diagnose myself i read a lot about like uh bipolar personality disorders uh, right. autism spectrum and you kind of the more you read you realize oh the brain is just doing the same stuff really in each yeah. case and the spectrum is so it's like your brain did A major coping or it did C minor, you know, but it is a different right. mixture right. of the same colors, uh, but it kind of tends to react in the same way. I, I think that the most, I think, you know, if this is interesting to you, I think to me in all of my reading and studies, the, the one sort of system of thought that made the most sense and that seemed to be most biologically uh, sort of congruent is called emotion focused therapy uh there are two systems both are called EFT. one is emotionally focused therapy like they needed to compete you know for the title but emotion focused therapy is developed by um a south african later canadian psychologist named les greenberg is to me the most really fundamentally uh logical and also like most effective psychotherapy i know and the basic idea there is that emotions are not decorations emotions are an evolutionary outcome and they are there to inform our behavior and that emotions like make sense from an evolutionary perspective like if it took you a while when you were you know uh hundred thousand years ago or whatever in the savannah and you saw a tiger and you were like debating what you're feeling and you weren't sure that you were scared you were going to pretty much diminish your chances of passing your genes to the next generation right and so each behavior has an action tendency each emotion has an action tendency that's linked to it so fear 
makes you, um, you know. I think it's why you have the word motion in a motion, you know. Um, right, <laughs> right, 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 absolutely. It's and like so, electronic motion, pre-motion. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And so, and then the thing is that if, if so, we, so uh, when your emotional processing works well, then you're you're in touch with your core emotions, and they lead you to action that promotes your survival. But then, the problem is something interferes, and then suddenly you're no longer in touch with your core emotions. Actually, this is the defense. The idea is that I'm scared, but I hate that feeling of being scared. And now I defend against it by actually being sad when I should be scared. Or right? angry. Or angry when I should be scared. Or, or sad when I'm actually angry. And then, and then I, that process is interrupted and I no longer cope in an adaptive way. And the process of therapy is to, and there is a methodology there, but the basic idea is that we remove the obstacles. We put you back in touch with what you're actually feeling. And that's, it has a very, and I think you're right in saying that all like uh, all pause, uh, all adaptive emotions have uh, worked similarly and all maladaptive emotions work similarly. So you can see with maladaptive, let's take maladaptive uh, anger or sadness versus adaptive anger or sadness. So the adaptive emotion it has, it's like a wave. It builds, there's a certain pinnacle, it goes down, and then it, in a way, it opens the way to a new emotion to come after it. It's, you know, but, but a maladaptive emotion, it's circular, it goes nowhere. Like you cry, and then perhaps you're tired, but you're not really, you haven't gotten rid of the sadness. Like, but with adaptive sadness, you cry, and you have mobilized something like you've reached out to like the action. Put yeah, there but I, I think this kind of stuff often depends on like circumstance. So, you know, like there's studies now that show that, okay, it's not so much the traumatic thing that happens. It's like whoever you have an ear to share it with afterwards. Right. So maybe whether that crying right. is adaptive or maladaptive just depends on like if you're doing it by yourself or <laughs> with someone that gives a shit. <laughs> no. Um, no, I don't. I don't think so. I think this is this is what this is the cause, right? But what I'm talking about is 20 years later. If you are, you know, if you were oh, traumatized, yeah, I know. Like yeah. The, yeah. Well, for me, the the general underlying point there is like the artificial artificiality, essentially of much of our desires and emotions. So I think one of the ways of, of just getting that broader concept is, is this now, like looking at the way the brain reacts. So when you feel certain things, you can go, oh, like that's just my brain. So this general kind of separation of self and the brain, which again, right. is something psychedelics are great right. from because many people I hear uh, have the experience of being able to <laughs> separate themselves from their brain and go, oh, what's right. going on here? And oh, look, I'm not that, am I? Because I'm thinking in language. Anyway, um, but you know, you, you get that access. So like, that's one way of achieving it, but um, uh, equally as important, if not more, no, is maybe just that conscious, like when you, when you read about patterns and then you, you realize, so my experience of doing all this reading was just realizing how textbook I was. So yeah, it might be complicated, but I'm also pretty textbook. No, the way I channel what happens to me might be complicated because I, you know, I, I try my best mostly to, to do something positive and be better and whatever. Uh, but but my, my reaction is like, well, I go through like 100% uh, textbook, you know? Well, so, um, well, you know, narcissism is fine. Hello, hello. Hello, do we know what happened? I think, I think your camera just can't like, handle it when you move around, you know? Really? Like, it has too much data to process. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, it's not, it's, I was just making a joke, so it's not important in any way. I think <laughs> but, I heard it, but, but, uh, it's a good indication that I'm not a narcissist. 
But yeah, reading about narcissism, I learned a lot about a lot of people <laughs> around me, and also, uh, and also like what I was saying before about the feedback and all of that. Those are definitely narcissistic tendencies that my brain does. It's only that me, whatever that is, more conscious goes, oh, I don't like that. Ooh, don't don't play into that. Uh, which is, I guess, essentially what you want to teach everybody if you're like emotionally and politically committed with education. Like, I think that is the thing you want to teach people. No? Right. Yeah. Like, sugar is nice, but. Right? Yeah, because that's the underlying idea of, and this is the dangerous thing for me of this like new arising culture of some of the new arising cultures at the moment. There seems to be this like idea that liberty is. Uh, exercising every single feeling and and urge and lust and whatever that you might have and part of the first thing we need to be taught about civilization is that hey there's this whole bunch of stuff that is natural for humans like raping each other beating each other up stealing from each other jealousy violence blah 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 and what we do as a civilization is say hey all of this now maladaptive stuff we're going to try and channel it out <laughs> that's what we're all doing <laughs> you know like no one's saying that <laughs> yeah and also and also i think it goes back to the brain because the we, what we forget is that the brain always always overcorrects for the negative right so for every positive experience, the brain is going to then overcorrect to, to, like, to make you feel just a little bit worse than you did before that you had the positive experience. It's not, even a balance, it's not even going to balance itself out. And then if it keeps overcorrecting, eventually the hinge is going to break and you're going to stay stuck in the negative. And so it's a real danger. And that's how our brain works. And so it's something that we should all be very careful about with food, with, uh, you know, with uh, adoration, with drugs, with, you know, with what have you, with any sort of pleasurable experience. Just the general concept of discipline seems to have escaped, like the, the political, social, political, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, right. yeah, it's like, and it go, it t it ties back to that book that we mentioned at the beginning, the crisis, the comfort crisis. Right? That it's very important to be to agree to being uncomfortable, and that there's a difference between discomfort and stress. Like we get, we stress got such a negative rep, but actually stress is pretty important. Without yeah, stress, like you're not going to be able to adapt to challenges. Lot. That's why we drink coffee, like literally release a stressful one, no? Just without the stressful situation. <laughs> um, so, I listen, I feel like, you know, I, I, you've been very generous with your time. I could ask you questions for hours, but perhaps in, sometimes in the future, we could do a second part to this or something. Agreed. And, uh, you know, if you're ever in Israel, uh, please please, please, please let me know. Um, I'd be happy to, you know, I don't know, join in the effort of something that you're doing. Cool. And um, yeah, and if there's any, you know, if you want to add anything, if you want, if you have any special message to, you know, Israeli audience, it's, um, I mean, you've said that with the Arabic for sure. That I think that maybe, because I just I thought about that very deeply when you asked me that if I have a message for Israeli audience and maybe I, I kind of got this new perspective being back in Cyprus that part of the experience of a Cypriot is to go away make an identity somewhere else and come back and understand Cyprus much more then and it kind of shifted my focus about Greek Turkish Greek Turkish Greek Turkish to kind of understand not everybody wants to learn Greek or Turkish right now they were on that journey that I was on, which was dissociate something new. So just that that might be the unobvious answer for a lot of people, you know, maybe they need to learn Spanish and go live in Spain or whatever experience, you know, and have that experience of the world and create 
a them that's free of the dictates of back home, although it's subject to new dictates, which right. you think about the ones back home. And I think in that way, like people can be a great service to themselves and also to the resolution of conflict. I love that. Oh, that was very new and intimate. It was beautiful. <laughs> and it's a new year. The only year difference year is that I actually meant it, where the stuff you hear at the UN. Mm. No, no, it was beautiful. <laughs> I love it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, put it out there. I thank you so much for, for all thank your you. work and for this interview. Okay, thank so you. we'll be in touch. I'll let you know how things went. Um, thank you for spreading this work with this interview. Thank you. Okay, bye. See you, bye-bye. Take care.